morning, everyone. Hey, it's good to see you. We're glad that you're here. If you're a guest, uh, as a church, it's our vision to connect people to Jesus and love our community. Uh, Today, we're wrapping up this series that we've been in, uh, talking about relationships and marriage, uh, titled Some Assembly Required. And and throughout this whole series, uh, we have recognized uh, that marriage is built, it doesn't happen. Relationships are built, they don't just happen. And we've kind of used this uh, analogy of building this Ikea bed frame together. And and so week one, it was the box, and we looked at the picture. And week two, we looked at the instructions. Uh, Last week... We looked at some of the main pieces, and then uh, we've got it built. Now, I, I, need to, I need to let you know that I don't know if there's anybody in this service, but I was a little bit surprised last week at the amount of people that came up to me after service and said, I didn't realize there was a bed on stage. <laughs> Friends, I don't know if we need a nap or what's going on, but this is a queen-size guy right here, and it was here all week last week, too, so... But I also, uh, week one, when we started this series, I, I said that we were going to give this whole bed frame away. And there's more parts uh, with drawers that go underneath and everything that we're going to give this away. And I, I said that you need to keep coming back to hear how, uh, how you can win this, how we're going to give this away. And so today, now the last week of the series, I want to tell you how to do that. And this is open for anybody. Uh, but on April 3rd, and this is a safe... Uh, on April 3rd at the church, uh, we are hosting a simulcast with Les and Lusty Parrot called Fight Night. Uh, and everybody is invited to that. It's $10 a couple. Uh, and from the registration of that event, okay, and this is not like, uh, guys, I want to I wanna tell you, this is not come and like, hear the ladies talk about marriage the whole time. Like, this is for both of us. It's fun. It's enjoyable. Uh, We're going to learn how to fight with our spouse. Okay, so I don't know if that's ever been a goal of yours, but we're going to learn that together. Uh, So, but from the registrations of the event, we're going to give this away to somebody. So now you know how to win that. There'll be more information coming uh, in the upcoming week about that. I don't know if you've ever been putting a project together and you get to the end and you have a piece left, right? Right? You're like, where does this go? Where? <laughs> True. <laughs> but then you start to think, where was it supposed to go? Where did, I, where did I miss? What did I miss? Where did I mess up? We put Legos together in our house. I'm not a big Lego guy. My boys are. Uh, and so we put these Lego sets together. And, and inevitably at the end, we get there and there's like, a, I've got a piece left. And so the boys look at me and especially Levi, I said, Dad, where was that supposed to go? I don't know. And so we flip back through the instructions and try to find where it goes. And he said, well, you're not supposed to have a piece left. Did you mess up? I was like, son, is it together? And quiet, all right? Just be thankful, grateful. Not really. That's in my head. I don't say it out loud. We get to the end. There's this piece that doesn't have a place. It's it's unknown. Hey, maybe I messed up, or maybe it's just an extra part. Hey, maybe the project is a little bit bigger, and you get to the end, and there's a piece missing. Or you get to the end, and you look at it, and you say, you know what? That's not level. That's not level. That's not straight. That's not supported well enough. You get to the end, and you realize, I didn't do that right. And then there's the phrase, I must have messed up. Probably that phrase has rattled around in your mind in a lot of other places than a project. Probably that phrase has rattled around in your mind when it comes to relationships, friendships, jobs, and for some of us, our marriage. I messed up. I messed up. And so the question is, when we mess up, or when things just become a mess, what happens? I want to pray and we're going to jump in. God, I'm so thankful to uh, God be with your people today. God, it's so good to be in your church. And Father, uh, as we as we meet this morning to study and to learn, to worship and to give, God, we're here to meet you. And God, for some of us, we're not even sure what that means. We're still learning that. God, some of us have been learning that for a while. God, wherever we're at, when it comes to following you, I pray this morning that as we as we sit here, we hear your words clearly. God, we hear your truth clearly. Father, I pray that we'll be humble enough to listen and bold enough to do something about it. 
Jesus, I'm thankful that because of your gift on a cross that has a room full of sinful people, God, even though we've messed up, God, you give us the hope of heaven. It's in your name we pray. Amen. A couple years ago, my good friend Rocky, some of you know Rocky, my brother-in-law Nathan, uh, they asked me one night at small group, hey, do you want to go mountain biking? Do I look like a mountain biker? No. And so I responded, no, I don't. I don't. And they, they said, no, it, it, it'll be fun. It, it's, it's an easy trail. I should have read between the lines. All right. You know when you're trying to convince someone, you maybe sugarcoat a little bit? Yeah, this was a lot of sugarcoating of easy trail. And if you mountain bike all the time, it probably is. But if you don't, and the only bike that you own is a road bike that goes on flat, then you're not a mountain biker. And so they said, no, come on, it'll be fun. I said, well, I don't have a bike. And Rocky says, well, I've got an extra one. Come to find out it was his wife's bike. And he said, I've got an extra one that you can ride. Okay. Uh, probably not. And they're like, no, it'll be fun. Promise, it's not that long. You know, we can go in the evening after work. Let's just go. And finally, I said, yes. So we get there. We meet in Moberly, we load up the bikes, and we get in the car, and everybody's excited. Well, everybody would be generous. I'm slightly apprehensive, yeah, because I don't know what I'm getting into. Uh, and I guess they have ridden this trail before, and so uh, we head south towards Columbia, north of Columbia. We pull into the parking lot, and I look around, and everything looks fairly flat. And I'm like, okay, maybe I can do this. But then the other side of my brain kicked in and said, they're not calling it mountain biking if it's flat. And so I knew that behind the trees and behind the wood line, it was not going to stay flat. And I thought, right. And so we get on, we get on the bikes, we kind of circle the uh, parking lot. And I'm kind of trying to play the part at this point, like feeling confident about myself. And then Rocky says, are you ready to go? Sure. Not ready to go. And so we take off down this path. And so far, it's just like little, you know, roll. And then it wasn't little rolls. And then we start hit, hitting hills, and we went up, and then we went down. And I really liked the down, except for I knew every time I went down, I was going to have to go back up. And I, I mean, I have ridden a bike my whole life, but I found myself falling off the bike multiple times. We weren't even halfway through. I had fallen off twice. I had cuts on my legs, I was dirty, and I thought to myself, you agreed to this, right? Like, you signed up for this. And so, so we're going, we're about three quarters of the way through, come to find out later, and we take a break. And they're like, Matt, isn't this so much fun? Yeah, so much. It's thrilling. So we're sitting there on this rock, and I mean, there's like, there's a creek running behind us, and everything, we're just sitting there talking, catching our breath, and... and said, are you ready to go? Sure, let's go. Let's try to finish this. And so we finish the trail. We get back to the parking lot, and they look at me and they say, are you ready for lap number two? <laughs> what? what? What is this, like torture, you know? Oh, no, we got to do a second lap. No, you have to do a second lap. I don't know this wee business. They're like, no, you got to go with us. The second, the second lap is easier. Listen, I believed you the first time around, okay? But now I've done it. Ignorance was bliss the first time. Now I know what I'm riding into. Like, it's not easier. Now I know what I'm going to have to pedal through. And they're like, no, now you know when to pedal and when to coast. And I'm like, I just learned to survive. I didn't pay attention to pedal or coasting, you know? And so we, <coughs> I finally agreed to it. And we take off, and I didn't pull off as much the second time, okay? I guess I did learn a little bit of pedal, coasting, whatever. And so we get about three-quarters away. We had just passed the spot where we did on the first lap. And I was behind Nathan, and all of a sudden, he starts to slow down, which I loved because that meant we got to go to slower pace. But Rocky was out in front, and Nathan, he comes all the way to a stop. I said, what are you doing? And he said, my tire's flat. I was like, oh. So I hollered at Rocky, and Rocky whips his bike around, and he comes back, and uh, Nathan says, my tire's flat. And Nathan asked me, he said, did you hear it pop or anything? I said, no, I couldn't hear it over my breathing. <laughs> and 
he, he's like, oh, okay, okay. And, and so Rocky pulls up, and, and, you know, he kind of assesses the situation, and he hops off his bike. And I know that if you ride bikes all the time, this is normal. This is not normal for me, okay? He hops off his bike. He kicks the kickstand out. He looks under his seat, and he unzips this, like, treasure trove of bike essentials, and it was like one of those magic chambers where you're pulling out like giant things out of this little pouch. And so Rocky, he unzips his pouch and he pulls out this bottle of fix a flat and he pulls out this air pump. He's pulling out all these things. I was like, is there a bottle in that thing? And he's pulling out all of these tools and he bends down and he starts working on the tire to get it aired back up. And Nathan and I, we're just standing there amazed that he had all that with him uh, and all of it fit in that pouch. We're just watching him do all this work and he's like hey can you hand me this and so we hand him that hey can you hand me this can you hand him that and he starts working on this tire trying to bring it back and didn't work he had all these tools and we were able we were able to spend a good amount of time working on this tire because he had all of the tools you see we have a lot of relationships in our life that they start out fun and they start out enjoyable. And then all of a sudden they start to lose air. But we have friendships. That everything is good in the friendship. But then someone has to move. And the friendship starts to lose a little bit of air. But we have coworkers that were great friends until all of a sudden both of you are up for a promotion. And only one gets it. And then the relationship begins to lose air air you were best friends at school until all of a sudden someone started to date someone else that you wanted to and now all of a sudden the relationship is there you sat in church next to this person for years and years you went to their wedding and you prayed with them cried with them and then all of a sudden they were for a change and you weren't and the relationship begins to lose air. You said your vows. And you thought it would be for forever. And all of a sudden the excitement and the new wears off. And conflict begins to rise up. And the marriage loses its air. And the struggle comes is in those moments... We don't have the tools to repair it. We don't have anything to fix the broken bike. And so we're left in all of these relationships is sitting as though we're just a broken bike. Sitting with no way to be fixed and no way to be repaired. Because we don't have any of the essential tools in order to make the repair. And so things just feel more broken and more broken and more broken. And for some of us, that's broken friendships this morning. For some broken relationships with a boss or co-workers. For some of us, it's broken friendships with people at school, even years ago. And for some of us, it's broken and failed marriages. And if we're honest this morning, it leaves us feeling dirty and wounded. We have memories of arguments and screaming matches that have now erased all of the happy moments. We have moments of anger and frustration that have erased all the moments of joy. And for many of us, we carry scars that have redefined our lives. We carry scars of hurt, hurtful words, hurtful actions. For some of us, we carry, we carry scars of resentment. And bitterness. Some of us, we carry scars of anger. When we were treated harshly or when we treated harshly. For some of us, we carry the deep scars of unfaithfulness. When we felt used, unloved, or undesirable. And while many of us have these from relationships with marriages and friendships. There are some of us that we sit there with some of these same emotions and scars from the church. 
And without the right tools, we don't know what to do. And once again, that phrase rings in our mind, I messed up. Which is why the words that we're going to read this morning from God's word are pivotal. They're essential. That even when the world wants to tell us about all of the broken in our lives and remind us about all of the scars and the guilt that come with them, Paul wants to bring different words to the table. If you brought a Bible, we're in Ephesians again, Ephesians chapter 4. Throughout this series, we've been talking about Paul's words as he writes this letter a whole bunch of years ago to this city in Ephesus. We know the book is Ephesians. And Paul is writing to this early church to remind them, as followers of Jesus, this is what it looks like to follow Jesus, your identity in Jesus. This is what it looks like in all the different areas of your life. And we've been kind of hanging out when he talks about marriages. But about a chapter before that, He's not even entering any specific place. He's just reminding them, as Jesus followers, this is what it looks like to live like Jesus. As people that claim Jesus in the early church, this is what it looks like to live for him. <coughs> in Ephesians chapter 4, in two verses, he gives us, he gives us some essential tools of what it looks like to live past these scars and these wounds. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to read verse 31 and 32. It says this. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. You see, as Paul writes these words, it's almost as though for our conversation and our illustration with the bed, it's within these two verses where Paul almost makes the bed, if you will. Like we can build the frame and we can construct it all the way through, but what makes the bed look finished is when you put a blanket on it, right? And I know some of us were make the bed as soon as you get up, people, and some of us are like, why waste the time? We're going to mess it up the next night, right? Like, I know there's two camps in the room, and I know some of us are nodding with both, and that's great, okay? But what makes the bed complete is the cover that goes over it. It keeps us warm, right? The bed, or the cover makes things look finished. The cover, it kind of brings it all together, and that's what Paul does here. As he introduces this idea of grace. You see, within these two verses, there is a get rid of and a give to. There's a get rid of and a give to. Amidst all the brokenness and all of the wounds that we carry with us, they, they cause us to be angry, don't they? They cause us to be bitter. They cause us to slander the people that have hurt us. And so as Paul, as he writes these words, he says, first thing we need to do is we need to get rid of. And he spells, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, and every form of malice. And what's interesting is in these two verses, twice, twice, Paul, in the original language, he uses this word all. Get rid of all bitterness, and then a little bit later it says, with every form of mouth. That every, that's the same word there. He uses this word all, which means there's not this out clause. And this word all, it is inclusive of every aspect of our life. All of the bitterness inside of you. Not just the places where it's easy. All of the anger that's in your life. Not just the places where it's convenient. Also, when he says all, he's also reminding us, even when we have been hurt. And so it's not get rid of all bitterness, anger, slander, malice, except for the anger that comes with your marriage. Except, except for the rage because they left you. Except, except for the bitterness that came when somebody wronged your family. You see, when Paul writes all, it really means all. It's not just part, and then the other part is okay because we were hurt by it. 
What Paul is telling us is that if we're going to move past this brokenness in our life, then we have to let go of the things that drag us down. It's almost as though each one of these words, they, there's weight attached to it. And as we, as we hang on to them, they drag us down. What happened when, maybe it's with your kids or your grandkids or even when you were a kid, when, when you fall, when you scrape a knee, when you bust an elbow and you go inside, what's the first thing that you either do or tell a kid to do? You've got to clean it, right? You've got to clean it. You have to get rid of the dirt before it can heal. And friends, there are too many of us walking around with broken relationships, expecting them to heal, but leaving the dirt in it. We walk around with the dirt of all of the broken in our lives and we're expecting it to heal. Things will not heal until we get rid of. And I know it's easy for Paul to write and it's easy to say, but when we know the hurt behind some of that dirt, it is not easy to walk away from, is it? It's not easy to just get rid of all of the emotions that broke us apart. It's not easy to just walk away from all of the emotions that leave us feeling empty. But it's also not designed to happen overnight. It's not designed to just happen an instant where you just kind of brush everything off and move on. The cleaning is a process and the healing is a process. So maybe each day, each day, it starts with, God, I give to you. I give my anger to you. God, I I give my slander to you. Where we don't carry it. Where we begin our day by handing it off, by getting rid of. And it's still going to pop up different places. But we begin each and every day with the process of getting rid of. Allow God to work in us. Paul then says, if we're going to get rid of this, then we have to give this. In verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. The way that Christ God forgave you. You see, we have to give grace. We have to give ourselves grace. We have to give others grace. We have to live compassionate and kind. And you're like, Matt, I don't want to. This person did this to me, and I don't want to be kind to them. I don't want to be compassionate to them. These words. It's if we're going to claim Jesus' grace, then we have to live with Jesus' grace. We have to first, and maybe this is the most important thing that you need to hear this morning, is that you have to give grace to yourself. There's some of us, we're looking at everything that we have done that has caused these wounds and caused these broken relationships, and we won't forgive us. Even though Jesus already has, we won't forgive us. And maybe before you're kind and compassionate to anybody else, you need to be compassionate to you and recognize that Jesus and you are free. You are not that broken moment, and that's not who, do, who you design. Who you were designed to be. Give grace to yourself. The way Christ has given, forgiven you. Maybe some of us recognize the grace given to us, but we cannot, we can't begin to give it to others. This morning I want to offer three suggestions. Three suggestions of ways to give grace. Three, three kind of simple, easy ways to give. Number one is to serve ferociously. Serve ferociously if it's in any type of taking on the posture of, posture of Jesus. It says far more than our words ever can. Just this past week, I had a conversation with someone here in town, a husband, and he asked me, not what, what am I supposed to do when I feel like I can't? right and I said the only thing that came to my mind is words that one of my preacher at my home church he said one time in a sermon 
He, said, he looked out at the crowd. He said, husbands, when you don't know what to do, pick up a broom and serve. See, because taking on the posture of Jesus places us, places us in the hands and feet of Jesus. You can't serve selfishly. If we don't know where to begin to give grace, to live compassionate and kind and forgive the way that Jesus forgives us, then let us serve ferociously. Serve others. Serve the person that wronged us. Serve the person that hurt us. Serve the person that left us. How is it that we are to be kind and compassionate, forgiving the way that Jesus has forgiven us? Is that we get rid of the scorecard. Get rid of the scorecard. We live in almost every place in our life with a scorecard in our hand, right? Like, was it good or was it not good? We go out to a restaurant and we evaluate the service. We evaluate the food. We evaluate the atmosphere. And we put tallies on our scorecard. Yeah, it was good. No, it wasn't good. Yeah, it was good. No, it wasn't good. In so many other places in life, we carry this scorecard with us. We carry it into our friendships, and we keep track of where did we go, who spent the most money, who gave the most, and we keep score. We bring it into our marriages. <coughs> we bring it into our marriages. They did this wrong. They did this right. They did this wrong. They did this right. We even bring a scorecard to church. Worship was good. Worship wasn't my, spot, my style. Good, bad. Sermon was good. Sermon wasn't good. Check mark, check mark. Coffee was hot. Coffee was lukewarm. They had my creamer. They didn't have my creamer. You know, I mean, all we carry this scorecard everywhere, including the church. And if we want to live as kind, compassionate Jesus people, then we have to let down this scorecard. We have to get rid of this scorecard because we can't live in the actions opposite of Jesus and expect the action of Jesus. But there's no way we would ever want Jesus to walk around following us with a scorecard, right? There's no way. And so we can't, we can't do the opposite of Jesus and expect to be like Jesus. We have to sit down and scorecard. How is it that we begin to live as kind, compassionate to one another and forgiving the way that Jesus has forgiven us? That we pray continually. We pray continually. Matt, I prayed for a long time and it didn't fix and so, friends, what if the goal of us praying continually is not to fix someone else, but to allow God to fix us? What if as we pray continually, it's not meant to solve a situation, but to begin to make you the person that God designed you to be? You see, we become kind and we become compassionate when we pray all the time, when we recognize that God is above all, through all, and working in all. We pray continually that God will first do something in us before we can ever do anything with anyone around us. That includes our spouse. Continually. That God will work in us. Be able to live as Jesus' people in order to give the grace that Jesus gives us. Because I don't, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to interact with someone that has wronged me, I pray way, way more for me in that moment than I need to, do, need to the other person, right? I need to pray that God will control my words and my anger and my attitude. <laughs> way more than anything else. We pray continually. We pray continually. First John chapter 1, verse 7 through 9 says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us all from sin. But if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from sin unrighteousness. And to claim Jesus, if we're going to claim the grace of Jesus, then we need to begin to pursue and to live the grace of Jesus. 
And I know a lot of us, when we talk about broken and we talk about relationships that have failed, that's who we feel like we are. We feel like we are the broken. My life, my life is in broken pieces and that's who I am. The failed friendships, the failed relationships, work, the failed marriages and that we wish we'd go back and do over and we convince our, ourselves and allow Satan to convince us that we are the broken pieces. Friends, when the grace of Jesus confronts our lives, broken pieces make beautiful stories. God is not in the business of leaving us as broken and falling apart. He is in the business of redefining and reshaping us and to tell the story of who he is. Broken pieces make beautiful stories. And verses that Paul, I mean, he's very clear about. It's not easy. And this word forgiveness, what we need to understand this morning, our truth for this morning is that grace is not just about forgiveness, it's about redefinition. Grace is not just about forgiveness, it's about redefinition. The grace of Jesus is not meant to just forgive you, it's designed to redefine you. It's not meant to just make one situation better. It's designed to change you from the inside out. That your heart is redefined. That your mind is redefined as you get rid of. And then you give to. Grace. Grace is not just about forgiveness. Grace is about redefinition. This morning for some of us. This morning, for some of us, we've not allowed grace to work in us. For some of us, we've not allowed Jesus to redefine our lives. For some of us, this morning, we find ourselves feeling the broken, living in the scars and the wounds. We're angry and we're bitter. And for some of us, in the moment, It's understandable. But you're not designed to stay in the broken. Because God wants to tell a redefined story through your life. You see, grace is not just about forgiveness. It's about redefinition. A couple years ago, I was headed down to Moberly. And I was just south of town. And uh, as I was was driving out of town, I, I noticed that there was a car parked on the side of the road, and there was, there was a girl, she was sitting on the hood of her car, and she just had her, uh, her head in her hands. I'm not always the most observant person, but I thought to myself, that doesn't look like the best situation. And so I, I was not on a tight schedule, and so uh, I stopped, and I turned around, and I got out, and I <coughs> kind of came up behind her car, and I said, do you need some help? And she kind of turned, and she looked at me, and she said, yeah, my car's got a flat tire. I said, okay. And I said, do you need help changing it? And she said to me, she said, I don't have, I don't have any of the tools to fix it. I said, okay. I said, do you have a spare tire? And she said, yeah, but I can't get that one off. Like, she was talking to me like I was not understanding. I said, no, I, under- I, I understand. I said, if I have the tools, I said, would you like help? And she said, yeah, that would be great. And she began to tell me about how she was late for work. And uh, <coughs> it was a newer job and all this other stuff. And she didn't want to be late, but she didn't know what to do. And uh, she said, I, I don't even know who to call. I said, well, I said, let me, let me go get what we need. And so I walked to the back of the car, and I, I got the jack out, and I got the tire iron out. And I walked up to the car, and I kind of started raising things up. And uh, I got the old tire off, and she's telling me all of her story. I mean, I, some of you are quick changing a tire. I'm not incredibly quick. And so uh, we had a few minutes, and she starts sharing with me her story. And it was a story of lots of broken pieces. And I told her about my family and a little bit why we were here and uh, everything like that. And I get the old tire off, and I get the new one on, and I kind of tighten things back up. And I said, I I think you're ready to go. And she said, thanks so much. She said, I don't know what I would have done. And I I said, it's it's really not a big deal. And uh, (laughs) she then said to me, she said, well, uh, this is the bar that I work at in Kirksville. And if you and your wife are ever up there, stop by and I'll give you a drink. And I thought, well, (laughs) 
I mean, you know, as long as you got your tire fixed, you know. I said, well, I said, you know, it, it's all right. I said, I'm just glad that I could help. And she said, me too. And she hopped in her car and she drove off. She was obviously late for work. And my guess is that there's a lot of us. My guess is there's a lot of us that in one season of our life or another, we can relate to that girl sitting at the side of the road. Broken don't know the tools to fix it and don't know where to turn and we feel like it's solely on us to fix it we feel like it's solely on us to find all of the solutions and to make all of the repairs and at the same time we also feel the guilt of how we messed it up but what if it's not on us to fix it. You see, as Jesus went to a cross, as Jesus walked these dusty roads, as he stepped down into this life, he stepped into our mess in order to fix it. And it's not up to you and me to fix all of the broken in our life. It's up to you and me to allow Jesus to move in our lives and to begin to tell a beautiful story through all the broken pieces of us. To allow his grace to invade and redefine our lives in the worst moments and in the best moments. And in all the places where we feel broken, we feel guilt, we feel shame, all the places in our life where we feel anger and bitterness and resentment. It's not up to us to solve. It's up to us to allow Jesus to move in our lives and to bring, to bring about a new season, a new story of healing and hope and forgiveness. You see, because his grace, it's not just meant to forgive us. It's meant to redefine our lives. Now, even in the good, he brings something better. And in the broken, he brings healing. See, grace, it's not just about forgiveness. It's about redefinition of our lives. And this morning, more than anything else, because he died for us, because he rescued us, because he went to a grave for us, Jesus doesn't want to just forgive us. He wants to redefine us in the now and in the future. Let's go ahead and stand together. We're going to worship together. And as we worship for, for, we recognize this morning that we're, that we're broken. There's some of us this morning that as we worship, recognize that our lives right now, they are with anger, resentment, malice, slander. They are defining us more than Jesus is. Maybe this morning as we worship, we begin the process. Jesus, take my, I give it to you. Take my anger, I give it to you. Jesus, take my bitterness. Help me to be not as bitter anymore. And we begin the process of getting rid of. Maybe this morning as we worship, some of us has, have accepted the grace of Jesus for ourselves. We just don't give it. We hold grudges. We get even. We're angry all the time. We've accepted the grace of Jesus in our life, but we don't give the grace of Jesus. We like the grace in our lives, but we do not want to give others. So maybe this morning as we worship, if too. Maybe right where you stand, it's, God, help me to give grace to. And you say a name as we worship. And maybe, maybe you, you can't see the grace moment yet where you extend it to this person. 
maybe as we worship, you find one of the people in the back and you allow them to pray God's grace on your life. And that God would free you from whatever. Maybe this morning as we worship, there's no way for you to give God's grace to someone else because you've never accepted his grace in your life. You've never accepted his grace to redefine you, change you. You've never accepted the grace of Jesus and enter the waters of baptism to be raised to a new life. And maybe this morning before we go any further, you have to recognize what Jesus has done for you. That he wasn't just a good man. He wasn't just a prophet. He, he was the savior of the world and he came to redefine us, to shape us, to mold us, things new. And maybe this morning as we worship, he needs to make you before we can go in. We worship. Not only does Jesus forgive us, but Jesus redefines us. Ask his will, we let him. Let's sing.